Joining me now is Dan Pfeiffer, former Obama senior advisor, co-host of Pod Save America, and the author of the Message Box newsletter. Also with me is my friend and colleague, Mark McKinnon, political strategist and former advisor to George Bush and John McCain. Dan and Mark. Dan, you're my friend, too, but we just haven't worked <laughs> together. Thank you both for being here. Um, I know there is a strategy behind this strategy that Trump is uh, employing. I just am having a hard time understanding exactly what it is. I mean, to be drawn into willingly a conversation about Kamala Harris's blackness two and a half weeks before Election Day doesn't seem like where you'd want to be necessarily. But I wonder if you have a smarter take on this, Dan. Like, what exactly the anti-trans blitz, the conversations about race, the bro podcast, the manoverse, I mean, what does this tell you about the, the closing, you know, how they see the end of this game playing out uh, going into November 5th? Well, the Trump campaign has a clear plan, right? The problem with their plan is that Donald Trump's their candidate, and he right. keeps stepping on it every time he goes out in public. But there's a strategy behind going on these podcasts. I'm just not sure Trump is executing the plan. They are trying to turn out low propensity voters who do not engage with political news. So they are particularly young, particularly online men. And the way you reach them is you do these podcasts with large followings on YouTube and TikTok, and it gets into their feed. But Trump is not maximizing those opportunities because he's Donald Trump. He was never great, and he's declining right before our eyes. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand the man over strategy, Mark. I get that they're trying to reach low propensity voters, high risk, high reward. It's just the conversations that happen once he's on these podcasts I don't know how they advance his cause. I wonder when you look at these two media strategies, you're a media guy, and if you could just take off a partisan hat one way or another, whose do you think is more effective? And I say that genuinely because there are people out there that I'm sure think Trump is doing what he needs to do to close the sale. Well, what, part of what I look at in any campaign is who has a consistent strategy. And right now, the Trump strategy is changing all over the place. I mean, yes, he's doing some of those broke podcasts, but Look what he's canceled in just the last couple of weeks, 60 Minutes, CNBC, the second debate, an NBC interview, an NRA rally. And, and meanwhile, Harris is going, you know, into the lion's den on Fox, Charlemagne the God, Call Her Daddy podcast. She's going everywhere, and suddenly she looks strong and confident, and he looks weak. And as Dan knows, in any presidential campaign, the most important attribute that people are looking at is the appearance and, and perception of strength in their candidate. And she, I mean, this, this trolling that she did at the rally today about the protesters saying that they're the wrong rally, go to the smaller one down the street. I mean, Dan, that's Obama level performance, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. Very I, good. I, I do. I, uh, the, the cancel, Trump's, I, I agree with Mark. Like the, the fact that people are looking at both these, these campaigns, Dan, and they're saying, oh, well, Harris must be desperate because she's going on Fox. At the same time, Trump is canceling a number of high-profile media interviews, which to me suggests he's not that confident or the campaign isn't that confident. Do you think in the, you know, in hindsight, she got what she needed to get out of that Fox interview? Absolutely, she got what she needed out of it. She looked strong. She handled Brett Baer. She handled the interruptions. Seven million people watched it. And do you know what the number one market in the country for that interview was? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so she got exactly what she wanted out of it. And you don't go on Fox as a Democrat because you're desperate. You go on Fox because you're confident. Yeah. And, that, and that is the thing you're seeing with Trump's strategy is his campaign strategy is to hide him as much as they can from voters over the last 17 or 18 days here or whatever it is, because he turns out the Democratic base, can repel swing voters. He works better as a gauzy idea of some sort of period with lower egg prices and pre-pandemic in people's eyes. And so the more he talks, the worse it is for him. I wonder, um, Mark, again, as a media guy, the, the ad strategy here. You know, Harris has ads that cover the waterfront, right? It's everything from Trump's fascist anti-democratic tendencies to her, you know, economic plan for the country to the question of abortion. We played some of them. Those are the official campaign ads. Then there's Future Forward, which we'll talk about in a second. Trump's closing message, or at least that of his super PACs, is an anti-trans message. Can you talk to me about that and, and how you you know, the Republican Party thinks that's a good idea. That's the winning message. That's what you want to, you know, that's your walkout music in, in the closing well, days of this race. You know, another mistake I think campaigns make is they look in the rear view mirror to look at what's worked in the past. This is sort of a Willie Horton strategy. You know, find a boogeyman and then just double down on a triple down. They, they don't have a positive message. And all they can do is try and damage Harris because she's got upside. He has a ceiling. She's growing. 
And, and she's got, you know, Democrats are enthusiastic by 10 more points than they are about Trump. She has a gender gap advantage. Uh, and so all they can do is try and scare voters about a policy that was in that, that was operative under Donald Trump. It's not it's not Kamala Harris's policy. It was operative under Donald Trump. So the policy isn't any different under the Biden administration than it was in the Trump administration. Although you never know that from the commercials. But but listen, I just think more broadly, she is on offense. I mean, she is. I just feel like the physics of this race have changed in the last few days. She's balling. He's stalling. It's just. You just feel it moving, and 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 and, and like at, at the rally today, she's just she's loose and she's and she's focused. And by the way, she's taking it to Trump, and she's she's talking about what kind of a, what kind of a country do we want to live in? And it's a really good closing message because I think the answer is Kamala Harris's is, is is her leadership. She's she's balling. <laughs> He's stalling. We're going to make a bumper sticker out of that, Dan. Future Forward, which is this super PAC supporting Harris, a wash in money, $700 million, is kind of the secret of organization that rigor rigorously tests messages. And according mm -hmm. to their sort of clinical findings, if you will, anti-Trump attack ads are not effective at moving the voters Harris needs to move. First of all, I mean, I wonder if that sounds right to you. And if that is being rigorously tested, how do you explain the disconnect between what, well, the, you know, the super PACs aren't coordinating with the campaigns, but Trump, I mean, Harris is out there going after Trump, as Mark says, almost religiously with a fervor at these big rallies she's having. And it's definitely part of her closing message. Well, I think what Future Forward would actually say is that the best ads are contrast ads, which have inf positive information about Kamala Harris and then negative information about Trump. And that does sound right to me, because if you look back at the New York Times national poll right after the debate, there were a, more than a quarter of voters said they needed to hear more from Kamala Harris. Only 10 percent of voters said they needed to hear more from Trump. Now, you still want to talk to that 10 percent of voters, but the key here, what is going to put people across the finish line, is going to get to her higher ceiling, as Mark referenced, is people understanding more about who she is, what she stands for, and what she's going to do. Now, all of that exists in contrast to what Trump's going to do. She's going to cut taxes for middle class families. She's going to cut them for the billionaires and corporations and stuff like that. But she, there's still more work to do because vote people want to be for her. They like her more than Trump, but they they want to know more before they actually pull the lever or fill in the bubble or however we're doing it in their state. And so, yeah, I agree with Future Forward's approach here. And that's and it's not inconsistent with the campaigns. I wonder, you know, when we talk about <laughs> where everybody's heads are at, <laughs> how much the polling matters, not as a sign of who's going to win, but in terms of um, changing the vibe shift, if you will, how much it's a matter of instilling confidence in your team, if you will, your voters ahead of Election Day and whether that's going to translate to an actual victory mark. Um, Dan has written very, very um, essentially, if you will, on his uh, substack about these excess of conservative polls that have come out in the last few weeks and what those are meant to do. And he makes a point, and I'll let you talk about this more in a second, Dan, that on the first count, these polls are coming out. They're being, um, they're being, they're being put out by conservative outlets because Republicans believe in the bandwagon effect in politics. They believe that undecided voters are going to side with the person they think will win. So if there are a whole bunch of polls showing Trump will win, then Trump voters and undecided voters are going to feel confident going to the ballot box. Second, and more importantly, the polls showing Trump winning are the predicate for the big lie 2.0. They must argue that Trump would have won absent some phantom voter fraud if and when Trump loses, he'll be holding up the junk polls as evidence the election was stolen. Um, on the first count, does that sound right? Trump voters, undecided voters want to vote for the winning side. Everybody wants to vote for the winning side. but And I do think Republicans are much better at this. They're, they're great at putting out sham polls, creating an artificial sense of confidence, and, 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 and just creating a bandwagon effect. Meanwhile, the Democrats are just great at bedwetting and whining and freaking out over every poll. But, but at the, I just wrote about this in Vanity Fair, uh, and, and I think it's, it's a fair point that they are, Republicans are trying to create a bandwagon effect with these polls that, that are very suspect. And you just have to put that away and say, listen, polls are either, either, you know, either being rigged by Republican polls or trying to create a bandwagon effect, or they're modeled after the 2020 election, which was an election where people may have voted for Joe Biden, I did, 
but they weren't they weren't excited about it and they may have voted for Donald Trump but even those voters weren't particularly excited about it so this election who are they excited about they're excited about Kamala Harris so look at the enthusiasm I mean as you said earlier it's a turnout game right there's no undecided voters out there it's just who's going to vote and if you have an enthusiasm advantage of 10 points and you have a gender gap advantage of 10 points I I know I'm betting my money it's on Kamala Harris I think she's going to win I think she might win easily I'm I'm going to I'm just going to take issue with the bedwetting thing because Dan and I know you've talked about this. It's a really close race. And if you're worried, if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican and you're worried here, that's not baseless. This is an insanely tight race. Dan, I think and panic's good. I think pan panic's good. Right. And that uh, could probably that could 2016 down. was people enough people did not panic. So panic's good. Bedwetting's great. And, and, and your second point in, in this writing, Dan, that these junk polls are going to be used to justify election fraud is reason for everybody to panic. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Mark is hitting it. There is Democrats and Republicans have approached this differently over the years. They want to create an image that they're going to win. And we want people to be worried that we're going to lose so that they'll turn out. Now, what's different in this election, which I think the Trump people have not accounted for, is when Obama was running, High turnout was good for us. All those low propensity voters, the poll said we're going to vote for Obama if they turned out. The opposite opposite is actually true in this race, where the lower propensity voters, people less likely to vote, are leaning more pro-Trump. And so they are using an old playbook for what may be a new environment. Mm -hmm. And for the big lie, this like everything Trump is doing here is to set up for an, an attempt, an ability to contest the election by whatever means necessary afterwards. And these polls are a piece of that plan. Dan Pfeiffer and Mark McKinnon, sages of the campaign trail. Thank you guys both for your time. It's great to see you. Chicken snacks. <laughs>